Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining. So uh, what we'll be covering today is at first we go over why uh, color matters. And then, as Simon already said, we cover some common uh, common color mistakes and also how to avoid them. So at the end, you'll be equipped to use color well and uh, harness its full power in data visualization. And then at the end, we wrap up with some help and uh, resources. And first of all, why color matters. And for this, we look at um, these four, you might say very extreme examples that don't use any color at all. And what you can see from this is that we can't really distinguish very well between categories. So in the top here, it's using different categories, but we can't really see which dot belongs to which category without any color. Um, also, the differences become harder to see. And also, we don't get any clues or information what the vis might be about, which color can tell us, which we can see if we go to the next slide, where they're all colored. Um, so now we can actually see very well in the top right chart here, the differences between them, um, between the different points in the scatter. Um, and also color, color helps us to understand and grasp the meaning quicker. For example, on the bottom left, this is the visualization about uh, temperatures and we already used or we've seen the visualization before and in the context of temperatures where red is used for warmer colors and blue is used for colder temperatures red is used for warmer temperatures and blue for colder ones. So we're already familiar with this and we can see in a, like quicker and understand quicker that this is a visualization showing temperatures. And then another, in this chart on the top left, there's another example of color association where the chart is about migrants crossings. And for this, we've decided to use blue as it, um, yeah, we associate it with water as well. So this chart is about something crossing over water. And, um, on the bottom right, I think it's a very extreme example of a chart that would use lose all its meaning if we don't use any color, because it shows leaves turning um, from green to brown, and the map starts out in completely uh, green at the beginning of the year, which we can see like this. Um, and then as time goes on, and the leaves change color, also the map changes color and shows yeah how the leaves are colored in uh, the United States, which is yeah a very extreme example where this wouldn't work if we wouldn't use any color at all and where color, yeah, has a meaning. So what we can see from these examples that of all design elements in data visualization, color is arguably one of the most important elements then that can speak to your audience in many ways. And at first we also quickly cover how our brains actually react to color. So our brain can process information such as shape, color and orientation in as little as just 13 milliseconds. And this process is known as pre-attentive processing and happens after visual input hits the retina. And what we can take from this, that our brain like can react to color and process color in as little as 13 milliseconds is that a well-selected color palette can harness this power and also make insights clearer. Whereas if we have a very badly chosen color palette, that makes it harder and we don't support our brain in being that quick and uh, it can obscure information and just make the data visualization less effective. So to summarize why color matters, it makes insights clearer and easier to find. And a well-chosen uh, colors reduce the time it takes your viewers to get insights from your chart and also helps you um, understand your message more easily. And uh, so you should always uh, use color to em also emphasize significant points in the chart and you can draw your um, audience's attention immediately to these points. And um, also color can help set the tone and evoke emotions. And uh, just all in all, it lets you tell a more effective story. But for color to have this power and do this, it needs to be done right. Um, and this is why we're covering some common common color mistakes in the next like around 30 minutes. And uh, we also tell you how you can avoid these and how you can just use color to make your vis more effective. So um, that leads us to the first pitfall, which is overwhelming with too many colors. So as we've just seen, colors are great for distinguishing between categories in your data, but if you use too many colors, it can have the opposite effect because then your visualization becomes hard to read. 
because when people encounter like lots of different colors, they naturally try to figure out what each of the colors represents. And if your colors confuse them or don't really have a clear meaning, it hinders the understanding. And to understand that better, we look at a few examples. Like on the left, you can see that the chart uses way too many uh, colors and also the colors don't have any meaning because the chart is showing the, pri the price of food items and every item is colored in a different color, which yeah, it doesn't have any meaning. It's just confusing. It's very overwhelming. And on the right, it's done in a better way because all bars, first of all, have the same color apart from one bar, which is in this case, the raspberries, they are highlighted um, because color is used yet yeah, to highlight a certain item. In this case, that raspberries are the most expensive fruit. We could have also highlighted every other bar, like depending what story we want to tell. But yeah, it's a good example to only use different colors when they actually mean something important in the data. Because yeah, colors do help your brain quickly identify um, differences, but then using lots of them makes it a lot harder. And uh, here we have another example where uh, it's showing interest rates that have been falling since the financial crisis, and it's showing the interest rates in four different countries. And in this example, again, like every a country is colored in a different color, but the colors don't have any meaning. Like you could swap any color of the countries and it doesn't really support the message. But then whereas if we go to the second slide, we see how this can be done a lot better because like the title is telling us that interest rates have gone negative in some countries and these countries are now colored in red. And this is also reflective in uh, reflected in the color red in the title for negative. So here, color is used to convey meaning and um, yeah, coloring the countries with negative interest rates in red, and it helps us understand the chart and get the message across. Um, and then our third example, again, is one uh, where it uses way too many colors, which makes the visualization almost impossible to read. So again, it shows the price of food items in the UK over time. And there are different food items displayed in the line chart, and all of them are colored in a different color. And just one of the things is that the legend takes up so much, so a lot of space in the chart. And then also the lines overlap as well. We don't see any patterns. We don't really know what to focus on. So how we can improve this is by grouping our categories or grouping some of the uh, items. So that was food, food items. So here we grouped them together like bakery items, dairy, fish, and so on, which only leaves us with eight groups and eight colors. And now we can also see patterns a lot better. Like we can see that in four of the groups, these four, um, we can see that the price actually has gone up, which we couldn't really tell in the slide before. So that way we can avoid using um, too many colors. And then another thing, which is also very good is that instead of using a legend at the top, we can also use line labels because this improves the chart even more as you don't have to go back and forth between the legend and the chart, which we've covered um, in one of our last webinars and where we also have a link to a blog post to that about text and data viz. And to summarize the three examples, um, you can avoid using too many colors by only using different colors when they actually mean something important in the data. And as a rule of thumb, avoid having more than six to eight colors in one chart. And if you find yourself having a lot of different colors, you can uh, either use a different chart type or also um, group categories together, like we've just seen. And another, what you also can do is consider using gray. So um, we have another example here, which shows the annual CO2 emissions. Um, over time, and it show, it's showing a lot of countries worldwide, and each country is colored in a different color, um, which again makes it look very messy, a bit overwhelming. We don't really know where to look at. So instead of doing this and assigning specific colors to each category, we can also uh, we could also highlight the most important elements and use gray um, for the less important elements. So in this version, we've decided that we want to highlight Brazil or we could highlight any other country that we kind of want to, is the focus of our story. And the rest of the countries are more for background information and context. 
So, and for Brazil, we then have used a very vibrant color and this line, the data for Brazil becomes more prominent. And we're also directing, uh, directly directing the user's attention um, to focus on this line. And uh, in Flourish, you can achieve that with a combination of the color override setting and the extent toggle, which we'll now um, quickly, uh, quickly show you. Um, so if we have this chart, how we had it before, and then at first in our settings, we would go to uh, the color section. And the first thing I would do is I would type in the country I want to highlight and just quickly pick the color and copy and paste it that I want my country to be. And then I can already see that this has worked because Brazil now is in the color I want it to be. And another thing is that I would just, I could just go to my color palette and then I want all of them to be in gray. So I just pick a gray that I like and I delete all the other ones. And then all of them are in gray and the, Accent toggle is it's not great to see if we use gray, but basically what it does, if I switch back maybe to this one, if the extent toggle is on, we only have three colors in our color palette, but then it would kind of, if it's checked, it's automatically generating more colors that are similar to the ones in our current palette. But then if we turn it off, it just loops around and uses the same three colors. Um, and then if we go back to gray, we turn it off because then it just uses the same shade of gray for all of them. So now we can see all our other countries are gray. We could adjust the type of gray as well. Um, and the other thing is we wanted to have um, Brazil, the line label. So we go to our label setting and tick show labels on lines. And at first, all of them are there. But we have here a field where we can just type in Brazil again. And uh, that's than the one that's highlighted there and all the other ones disappear. And just to quickly say it's Brazil because it's how the our column is named in the background in the data tab. So yeah, this is how it will work in Flourish. And we also have um, a help doc on this as well where the steps are detailed. And yeah, are there any questions so far? I think we're all good. Okay, nice. Um, then we continue with the second uh, pitfall, which is overlooking the importance of contrast. So um, when you're putting together a palette of colors, it's of course important that they go together harmoniously and that also that they catch the reader's eye. And you might think that in this, when doing this, that going for super bright and vivid colors is the way to go, but that actually isn't really the case. Um, because it is true that bright and bold colors do grab the most attention, but then if you use them extensively in a large area, which would the chart, which the chart would be, that can actually um, lead to eye strain and make it harder for your audience to focus on your chart. Um, because like you have to remember that understanding a graph or map requires more than a quick glance, but that your readers are actually focusing on your chart, on your visualization for a while. So opting for more subdued colors is a better approach. So this is why like the colors in this row here um, are not the ones we should go for because they're very bright and vivid. And um, instead we should avoid using colors at their maximum intensity in both saturation and brightness. Like colors in this row here um, would be better and we'll come to how we achieve this. But um, yeah, in the bottom row, these are the colors we wanna go for. And um, we have come to this other row by tweaking the HSB of each color. Um, so HSB stands for the H stands for hue, the S for saturation, and uh, the B stands for brightness. So we can see at the top, all the um, all the colors are at 100% saturation and 100% brightness. Um, and by tweaking this, we um, create more subdued tones which is better for large areas like charts. Like for example, if we take pure yellow as an example, which is this one at the top here, um, the HSB was 60 degrees hue, 100% saturation and also 100% brightness. And 
we can achieve a softer yellow by darkening, darkening it. For example, if we would uh, reduce the brightness, we can gray it out um, by adjusting the saturation, which we have done here because we have just 70% saturation instead of 100% before. Or we can also shift away from the pure hue by around five to 10 degrees, which we have done as well because it's only at 53 degrees. So um, this is in theory how we can create more like palettes that are softer in the eye and more subdued. And luckily there are some tools you can use and that can support you in doing this. For example, like coolers.co or Google's color picker. And I just quickly show you how this works. So if we go back to our yellow example, we have um, put our hex code in here. So this is the very bright yellow that we had before. And if we click on select color, so this is using colors, coolers.co. Um, and if we go on here, we had our, that's why we pasted our hex code. And then instead of going for picker, we would click on this and select HSB from the options we have. And then you can see that here we can actually tweak the values. Um, so we can say we want to have slightly lower saturation. Um, we can decrease the brightness and we can also change the hue slightly. Maybe we say 53 is a bit extreme, but like just experiment with it until we're happy. Like this way would be a bit darker and softer yellow that's not that hard on the eye. And we can experiment like shift the values or the, yeah, the values until we're happy. And then we have a new hex code uh, we can copy and copy in the flourish and use that. Um, so yeah, these tools and uh, are great for you to fine tune the hue and uh, the saturation and the brightness. And yeah, they're great for so just um, creating custom color palettes. And in addition to what we've just done, like um, adjusting the opacity, uh, the saturation and brightness, we also recommend um, reducing the opacity of large chart elements, for example, of area charts or bar charts. And this can be another very simple, but also very effective method to alleviate eye strain. So on the left, we see an area chart created with the uh, colors in the top row that are very vivid and very bright. And it's also using them at full opacity. So we can see this is very extreme, very full on the eye. Um, and then on the right, we have an example that is a lot better because it's for once using the subdued colors that we've created before. And it's also using them at, at a reduced opacity instead of 100% opacity, which is the setting you have in our area charts and Flourish and uh, also in bar charts. And we also have an easy guide and a help doc on this, um, how to make individual colors more transparent in your Flourish color palette. And that then leads us to our third pitfall, which is uh, overlooking accessibility best practices. So uh, like we've just learned, opting for slightly subdued colors is a best practice. But it's also equally important um, to consider the contrast between the colors in your palette to ensure accessibility for everyone. Because um, globally, at least 2.2 billion people have a vision impairment. So we should always be aware of color combinations that can po pose challenges for those um, with color vision deficiencies um, due to the similarity in their appearance. So there are different types of color vision deficiencies. and the first one is protonopia, where people are unable to perceive red light. Then there's deuteranopia, which is the most common form of color blindness, where people are unable to perceive green light. And then there's tritonopia, where people are unable to receive blue light. And if we look at the three charts over here, um, we can see that this is how someone who doesn't have any color vision deficiencies would see them. This is how we might choose them in our color palette. Um, but then this is how someone with each type of color vision deficiency would actually see them. So um, we can see that the colors that looked very different before now look very similar to each other and the contrast isn't very high between them. So it's always important to double check that your charts are accessible to everyone. Um, and to then, if you notice they aren't really great, if someone with a color deficiency sees them to adjust your colors, so it's better for everyone. And 
Luckily, there are some online tools that help you assess the accessibility of your chosen color palette. So for example, um, there's a browser extension called Let's Get Colorblind. That is great for simulating how your visuals might be perceived um, by individuals with uh, different forms of color blindness. Um, so this is a color, uh, a browser extension in the Chrome, in Chrome, using Chrome. And um, it has different options. So one is seeing your chart, how it would normally, how you, how someone without any color vision deficiency would see it. And then you can do uh, through a toggle between the different types of color blindness to see how your chart would look to each of them. And then as a result, you can leave it because you think it's good and it has enough contrast, um, or you can make um, changes to ensure that the data visualizations are accessible and meaningful for everyone. And another thing to keep in mind is that your branding guidelines might may dictate a specific background color for your visualizations, or you might want to try out a different background color, or you want to try out how it looks on a black background, blue background, and so on. But it's worth bearing in mind that not all colors work well on color backgrounds. So um, when it comes to contrast, the web content accessibility guidelines provide information on achieving um, optimal contrast ratios for text and graphic elements. Although it is important to say that data visualization still occupy a kind of uncertain territory in this regard, but still it's like a uh, useful, very useful to keep in mind. And there's a um, new color contrast method called advanced perceptual contrast algorithm, which uses an updated scoring system for calculating contrast and taking text size and text weight into account. Um, and what is very useful is that there's a contrast calculator, um, APCA's contrast calculator, and it is a very valuable tool that allows you whether to test uh, to test whether your labels um, and colors maintain a strong enough contrast against the chosen background. Um, so anything below 15 would basically be invisible. So on the there are two visualizations here using different background colors. Um, so on the left, we have like a kind of bluish background and um, our chart colors are like pink and green. And then we have like a kind of gray color for the text. And we can see if we check, if we use the contrast calculator for this, we can see that for the text, we would fail because um, it is for text, it is advisable to achieve contrast of more than 60. But doing this would give us or would tell us that we only have a contrast of 50.5, which would be good for, or would be fine for large text, but then not for smaller text. So in this regard, we would fail. Um, and then the pink, it gives us a contrast of 38.5, which is over 15. And uh, it says we would pass this for icons and graphics. And um, the last one is the bright green, which has a contrast of zero. Um, so the worst possible um, score, and we would fail this based on this. So that kind of tells us that maybe we shouldn't use like that's not the best combinations of colors and background. And um, we can compare this to using a, like a more beige background where we see we would pass on all three with all three colors. So our text contrast would be even higher now. Um, like for the gray, it would be 62.2. So it's more than 60, um, which is good. And then um, our two chart colors um, achieve enough contrast as well. So this is are color combinations we can use, which are good. Um, so yeah, this is very useful to do whenever you think of putting colors on a background or even putting like using a white background and very light colors. And uh, another thing to keep in mind is to leave some spacing between each color like we did in this example here on the right, um, because this makes it easier to tell your two colors and bars apart um, and also improves the overall clarity of your visualization. And then the last thing to mention in the section is that at Flourish, we also utilize APCA CA to auto adjust a label contrast in our line bar pie and hierarchy templates. What this option does is that it changes the text color of the labels to black on pale backgrounds and to white on dark backgrounds. And how this works is if we go to this chart here, which again is using our um, pink and green that we've used before. 
And in our settings on the right, we have a section for labels. And when they're turned on, we have the text color. And this is important that it's set to contrast because if it's set to contrast, it will always use the colors that have um, the best contrast. So for example, we could say match data as well, and then it would color it in the same color as the bars or fixed. And we could just give them a fixed color, but then that wouldn't take the different, um, yeah, the best contrast into account. Um, and we can also see this if we now change our colors and we say we have the blue. Um, so now before the label was black because it was on a very light background, but now that background is darker, the label color automatically changes to white to achieve the best possible contrast. And yeah, this happened. This just yeah works with any color we can choose. It will always automatically adjust. Um Vanessa, uh, yeah. sorry, uh, to interrupt you, um, can I, may I just ask you to demonstrate the last thing, but by um, increasing your tab size a little bit? My, just the, oh, the. Yeah, because uh, it might be a bit hard for um, others to see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, if we again uh, go back here in the settings on the right, we see labels and now a lot better to see. Um, it is important to pick contrast here if we are in the section of the text color, which is the text color of the labels. And um, if we go for fixed, we can have one color, but that would apply to all the labels we have. So it wouldn't take the color of the bars into account. Um, so yeah, if we go to contrast, it will automatically adapt the label color if we change um, the color of the bars. So if we go back, to picking a very light color, we can see that now our labels are black again um, to yeah, achieve optimum, optimal contrast. And this one would turn it to white again. Okay. Um, so our next pitfall, already the fourth one, is applying colors inconsistently. So as we know, visualizations are very powerful storytellers, but in order to do so, or they are especially powerful if they are consistent. So if we have multiple visualizations on the same topic and also using the same variables, it's very important to be consistent with our choice of color. So to avoid, avoid confusion, we should make sure to use identical colors for the same variables in all of our charts. So for example, um, here we have, um, let's say we have multiple visualizations on population statistics and all of them featuring births and deaths. Like we have the two examples over here, which both feature births and deaths. And to be consistent, we have colored the deaths in both charts in a kind of blue, bluish purple color and the births in pink. Um, so when someone looks at the first chart and then at the second one, they might still remember that the births in the first chart are colored in a certain pink and expected to be the same way in our second chart again. And especially the case if there are more than like even more charts on the same topic. And like now, let's say if we would switch up our color scheme in each graph, it would be very tough for uh, readers to follow the story. And it can also um, take them or yeah, make it that readers take one um, data series for the other because they are only up first was colored in pink before. So it should be in pink again um, and things like that. So yeah, to avoid confusion, it's always good to, or we should always use the same color for the same variables in each chart. Um, yeah. And another thing to keep in mind and the same is um, when it comes to choosing your colors for your categories, we should consider the meaning um, in the culture of the target audience or um, also always use colors that readers will already associate with the data. So, um, we always like we automatically have some colors that we associate with certain things. Um, so one of these are always like party colors. So um, for example, over here in this, um, here there are two bubbles and they're colored by the Repub uh, by the American parties. And we would automatically think that the red bubble is Republicans and the blue one is Democrats because these are the colors we know, we remember, and we are already familiar with. The same with other parties in the UK, Spain, Germany, like we always associate certain party colors with the party. So if you would then switch them up or use them the other way around, that would be very confusing. 
And the same way we have learned what some colors stand for, like if we see red, we think of attention, stop, or something bad. And if we think about green, we think about go or something positive and good. So again, if we suddenly use red for very positive things, it wouldn't be clear immediately and it could be very confusing um, why this color is used for that or if we just, yeah, switch them up. Um, and then as we've already seen in one of the first examples earlier that the same goes for temperatures that we associate red with warmer temperatures and blue with colder ones. And there are also certain colors in terms of nature um, where if we see green, we think of forests or trees and with blue, we would associate um, associate water or lake or the sea. So if we use these colors together and then swap them the other way around, that would be very confusing. And there are so many more color pairs and other um, yeah, color associations to keep in mind um, when picking uh, your color palette and especially when like visualize, visualizing a certain topic. Um, and then also when using color, it's always important to tell your readers what your colors stand for. And there are several ways you can do this. So for example, just using a standard legend like we've done here um, at the top or at the bottom where you place it in your chart, which uh, is the key, the color key, um, telling the readers what your color stand for. Instead, you can also use the title and um, have the type words in the title that represent your data colored in the <laughs> color of the data. So um, in, for example, this example here, um, we, which you can't see in the chart, but we have visualized hybrid and remote workers, and we use the title to um, have the hybrid colored in blue because in the chart, the hybrid workers are colored in this blue and like this turquoise color is used for the remote workers. So instead of having a legend at the top, we just colored the words in the title to tell everyone yeah, what the color stand for. And um, the third option you have is using line labels, like we've mentioned before, that that's sometimes easier because then you don't have to go back and forth between the legend and the lines, but you just have at the end of the line, you have uh, the label, what your line stands for. Uh, like this one here with projected deaths and projected births at the end of the line. And um, yeah, this already brings us to our last pitfall, which is uh, using the wrong color scale. So um, color scales can be categorical or numerical and a categorical color scale splits data into groups, or categories like um, income regions or types of industry. Like in this chart on the left here, we are visualized or we are showing um, data on the 2020 presidential election and showing the winner per state. And this is very clearly visualized. And again, it's a good example for the uh, color associations that we've used red for the Republican party and blue for the Democrats. So we can on first glance see which states had uh, which party as a winner, um, which yeah is using a categorical um, scale. And then on the right is a map using a numerical color scale and a numeric color scale uh, assigns a color to each element on the chart based on its value. So basically um, each value in your data is translated into a specific color. So in this chart on the right, we have visualized the vote change as a percentage also during the 2020 presidential election. And here we can see that the color is mapped from the lowest value to the highest value, which is from 5.1 to 33.9%. And corresponding to this, the map is like the states that had a lower percentage of vote change, like North Dakota are colored in a lighter color. And all the states that had like a higher percentage are colored in a darker color. Also, this is a good example where um, it is advised to use light or bright colors for low values and dark colors for high values, because that's the most intuitive for all readers. And we would automatically assume that, yeah, lower values have a lighter color. And um, if you are not sure which is the right scale, then you should just ask yourself, is your color showing us the data you're showing and that you want to show on a map? Um, is it showing numbers or categories? And also which helps in Flourish if you, for example, want to visualize your data in a projection map and um, you assign your color, uh, your, uh, your column in the data that you want to color your map by. If you assign this, then Flourish um, will automatically 
see if it's numbers or categories or text. And then it will auto detect um, and auto select the color scale um, and show you the right color scale. So basically, if you put this data on the left here, which uh, with your color for each uh, with each state has a column where it says Democrat or Republican, depending on which party has won, and you will use this column um, to visualize this, then uh, Flourish would automatically show you the right uh, color scale. And you wouldn't even be able to visualize this categorical data as a numerical color scale. So um, yeah, this is where it makes you this step a lot easier. But then still, if you have numerical color scales, these can be sequential or diverging. Um, so a sequential color scale um, maps all the values in your data to the color spectrum. So this is the same chart as we've seen before, where it goes from the lowest to the highest, and it's just one gradient. Um, and all of them are colored from a low color to a lighter color to a darker color. And whereas a diverging color scale, a color scale has a natural break in the middle, and this splits the data into at least two groups. So for this chart, we are showing the margin of victory in each state. And we can see that the break is in the middle, it's the zero, and everything that um, goes from minus 100 to zero, which represents a margin of victory margin of victory in favor of the Republican Party. This is colored in one color, and this time it's the kind of a shade of the red again, like the what stands for the uh, Republican Party. And then everything that was a margin of victory in favor of the Democrat Party is colored in blue, so in a different color. So we can see on first glance on the map, we can see um, which states had a margin of victory in favor of which party, basically. And um, if you're thinking about which one to use, it's basically kind of quite easy because you just have to check if your data has a clear split that you want to highlight. Because if it doesn't have a clear split, you should always use the sequential color palette. But if it has um, a clear split, then it would be a diverging color scale. Um, and a clear split could be um, like here, like um, data below and above zero, or it could also be that you have it below an average. So you want to have an average and an average, and you want to visualize um, everything below and above an av average in two different colors. So then you would use a diverging color scale as well. And then again, each of these color scales can be either linear or binned. So linear just means that the colors in the chart extend from the lightest to the darkest shade infinitely, like a gradient. So in this one, it's the same as we've seen before that um, the map is colored in the same in one sh shade from light to dark, from the lowest value to the highest value. And the bin color scale, in the bin color scale, we have a specific number of bins. And each of these bins have um, an assigned color and a specific number of values that fall into each bin. So um, if we look at the map on the right here, we can see that we have five different bins. Um, and for example, the first bin here, the very light color goes from 14.61 to 24.31. So all the states that have a value in this range would then just be colored in the same color. So which we can see it's Utah and Colorado because they both fall into this range into this first bin. So they are colored in the same color. Whereas if we go back to our linear scale, we can see that Utah and Colorado are colored in slightly different shades because they don't actually have the same value because they are like 16 and 19. So they are slightly different if we use a linear color scale, but then if we use bins, they would um, have the same color because they fall into the same bin. And as you can see, like color scales aren't the easiest thing, um, but there are some tools that really help you um, when you choose the best colors for your chart. So for example, one of them is Peloton, which is a great resource um, when creating categorical palettes. So um, like you can see in the screenshot here, you can select up to four colors and then get also get their gradients if you want to. And especially when working with maps, Color Brewer is a great tool to get inspiration. You can see it in the screenshot over here because it offers preloaded standard palettes and um, you can also filter them for some accessibility or legibility criteria. So you can say you only want 
to um, actually see uh, the palettes that would be good or like are still accessible for someone with a color vision deficiency, um, which is very useful as well, like we've covered before. And yeah, to wrap up, we we'll now have our key takeaways. So um, as we've learned, a color can be used to make insights clearer and easier to find. And we can use color to emphasize significant points in the chart and color lets tell a more effective story. Uh, to harness the full power of color, we should limit the number of colors in our charts to avoid confusion. And it's recommended to using six to eight colors. Um, also, we should avoid using hues or colors at the maximum intensity in both saturation and brightness. And in addition to this, also reduce the opacity of large chart elements, um, such as area charts or bars, to alleviate eye strain. Um, it's always important to use online tools and to assess the accessibility of the chosen color palette to make sure that our charts are accessible and meaningful to everyone. And in the same sense, also check whether your labels and colors maintain a strong enough uh, contrast against your chosen background. If we have uh, a number of um, a number of uh, charts on the same topic using the same variables, we should use the same colors so not to confuse um, our readers. And like we just learned in the last step, um, always make sure to use the right color scale. Amazing. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, that was brilliant. And I hope it was really valuable to um, everyone today. While we all have you here, <laughs> um, we will just go through a couple of new things that we launched in Flourish um, in the last month, um, which is probably my new favorite template, um, the 3D Globe. Um, we just launched this uh, maybe a week or two weeks ago, uh, but it's basically a new, very interactive and uh, visually stunning way for you to visualize geospatial data and geographical coordinates. Um, this is a free template available to every everybody in Flourish. And uh, if you would like to read more about uh, its use cases and how you can get the most out of this template, you can read more on our blog. Um, and another exciting feature um, is that we uh, enabled a new grid layout option to display the title, legend, notes, and everything else um, uh, you have in terms of text um, in your visualization on the left, as opposed to on the top of um, your chart. So as you can see in the example here on the left, you basically have the title and the subtitle of the visualization right next to the globe itself, as opposed to above it, which is a really cool uh, and nice way to visualize um, data <laughs> and information. And if you're ever curious um, what else is new in Flourish, you can always uh, check our change log. Um, we'll be sharing a link to this in a second. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed this webinar, we would love to see you for our final session of the year. Uh, basically, this is a year in review 2023, uh, where uh, our amazing colleague Annie will be joined by uh, a few members of our product team. Uh, so you can learn more about um, what features we launched uh, in the past 12 months, uh, some impressive projects that were created by the Flourish community uh, and by Flourish and Canva as an organization together. Uh, and of course, you'll get a sneak peek at our roadmap for 2024. So if you're a um, Flourish super fan and you would like to stay on top of things, you can uh, join on the 5th of December, as always, um, for a free session. Um, and... To wrap up today's session, before we maybe move on to questions, if anybody has any, um, um, these are the resources that uh, Vanessa has used throughout the webinar. Uh, basically, we have um, everything from help docs and blog posts to actually um, uh, external resources that might help you uh, delve a bit more into the topic of color. Um, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Vanessa, if you would like to share. Uh, no, okay. No, I don't think so. Um, perfect. And um, last but not least, obviously, the useful tools uh, that uh, Vanessa used throughout the webinar. Uh, I saw someone asking in the chat about Paleton. Um, I'll be sharing this in the chat if you need it immediately. But basically, uh, on this slide, you can actually find all the useful tools that we use, such as Paleton, Color Brewer, uh, Let's uh, Go uh, colorblind, which is the uh, extension for Google Chrome, as well as um, the color tools that you can use to check either uh, your 
contrast or uh, create a color palette. If you have any questions, uh, whether it's about uh, future webinars or um, anything else, you can always reach out to us at flourishwebinar at canva.com. And for anything else, any technical queries, uh, specific visualizations, uh, and etc., you can reach out at hello at flourish.studio. Thank you again, everybody, for joining. And uh, we really hope that you enjoyed the session. And you'll hear from us uh, with the recording and uh, slides very soon. Thank you for joining today.